I hope 2022 has been very good for you so far. I'm Joyce, and together with my colleagues, we run the StackX DevRel work here in GovTech. So uh, Lunar New Year is around the corner as well, so we would first like to wish everyone good health and good luck ahead. Uh, we are seeing many familiar names, so thank you for being here and showing support for our past meetups. Uh, for those attending for the first time, we look forward to having you regularly from now. So uh, just a friendly reminder that our StackX feedback poll uh, is still open till 7th of Feb this year. Uh, we would love to hear from you so that we can curate more content to share this year. So um, before we start, we'd like to run through a couple of house rules. Um, please note that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll be sharing a VOD for this session. Uh, so keep a lookout for our announcement in the StackX uh, Telegram group chat. So uh, we also ask that your questions be kept to the pre topics presented today uh, to keep the session meaningful. Do feel free to type your questions and comments via the Q&A panel button below. So throughout the webinar, our speakers will be um, looking at the Q&A panel and then we will take your questions from there. So uh, let me just share the link for the StackX Telegram uh, where you will get, where you will get um, notification of our announcements. So uh, we are very excited to have our very own GovTechie as well as a guest speaker from Confluent at our meetup today. So Kian Chai and Kai Jin will discuss the various data sharing solutions used by the public sector and industry to overcome challenges in sharing data efficiently and securely. Kian Chai will be sharing about ADEX, while Kai Jin will talk about how to provide improved customer delivery processes. Uh, so yes, once again, at any time, please feel free to ask questions um, or give comments via the Q&A panel. So for those of you who are new today, uh, here are just some quick facts about us. Uh, GovTech, we are happy to say, uh, is now more than 3,000 strong. And our work is broadly classified into um, these areas you see on screen. So the product team manages the WOG, our whole of government infrastructure, from our move to commercial cloud, um, to data centers, and to issuance of devices to all public officers. Uh, the services group is the biggest of uh, the three, and they actually manage technology in over 60% of government agencies in Singapore. And uh, govern cyber and governance, uh, last but not least, um, so we are the GovTech cyber, uh, sector lead sorry, for cyber security in the government. And um, our, cyber, uh, our governance group uh, sets ICT policies and guidelines across the whole of government. So um, to engage and connect with both the public sector and industry techies, uh, like all of you here, we formed the StackX community in 2019. So uh, as you, if you have not joined yet, um, you can feel free to scan the QR code uh, on screen right now. Uh, I'll also be sharing the links uh, for those of you who find it easier. So uh, updates, as uh, we mentioned, on our latest StackX meetups as well as um, VODs will be shared with our community via um, the StackX meetup as well as the Telegram group. So uh, these are really, really great ways to stay connected and informed. And uh, do also encourage like-minded friends to join us uh, on both of these platforms so that we can all benefit from um, the diverse cross-sharing opportunities everyone will bring uh, within our community. So uh, since 2020, uh, Singapore Government Developer Portal, uh, or Dev Portal for short, has been a one-stop resource hub for government officers and vendors undertaking uh, digital transformation projects. So uh, featuring over 120 products and services that are targeted at various aspects of digital transformation, uh, you'll be able to find a range of content covering guidelines, um, technologies, technical documentation, and communities. Uh, recent additions to the Singapore Government Developer Portal include write-ups on the Government on Commercial Cloud, uh, GCC 2.0, um, and TechPass. So we strongly encourage you to hop onto the site and find out more. You can scan the QR code uh, as always, or I will share the link um, in the chat now as well. So in terms of um, data-driven innovation from GovTech, uh, ADEX and APEX are two data sharing platforms that are relevant to today's uh, team. ADEX is a real-time event data exchange platform for WOG, uh, as I'm sure Ken Chai will be able to tell you more later, while APEX is an API-based data sharing platform and uh, API catalog for the Singapore government. So I'll also share some links um, in the chat for your reading uh, later on. So this year, we are continuing our support for the tech community. So we have contract and perm positions available, so you should be able to find um, some interesting roles. If you do know of any other friends who may be keen uh, as well, uh, please feel free to share this with them. 
So now, uh, I'm sure this is the part everyone is anticipating. Let's welcome Kian Chai, who will talk about data mesh in the Singapore government. Kian Chai, please. Thank you, Joyce. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kian Chai, the tech lead for EDEX. The next video. So uh, in Singapore, Singapore has moved from computerization to digitalization since a long time ago. So it's from C to D. Yeah. The Smart Mission Program Office was launched in 2014. The effort comes with three pillars. If you go online and check, you see uh, these three are digital government, digital economy, and digital society. Digital government is led by the Smart Nation and Digital Government Group, SNDGG, which involves agencies from across the public service. Since the 2000s, uh, we had more government services that went online from forms to web. In 2010s, we see more integration and more uh, citizen-centric apps. In 2020s, we went cloud-based and seeing more sharing and more real-time use cases. Next. As part of the Smart Nation initiative, there are strategic mission projects like uh, NDI, e-payments, and LifeSG. Then there is the Smart Nation sensor platform project, which consists of uh, sensor-related projects, including the sensor data exchange, or SDX. SDX was built as a central exchange for sensor data with a self-service portal to discover the data. It helps agencies to reduce investment costs and to encourage innovation among the team. Next. So SDX started during the IoT days, during the boom of the Internet of Things. As an exchange for sensor data, we had weather data from NEA, safe entry data, and then post data, which consists of some weather sensors and some video feeds. So one example of sharing data is like weather sensors between agencies. Like NEA has several weather sensors deployed all over Singapore, while HDB has their own weather sensors in the same or different areas. There are flood sensors between NEA and DSTA also. So Having SDX can help to reduce the duplicate deployment of similar sensors. Then we started seeing non-sensor use cases like real-time safe distancing and enforcement or updating your home address should trigger an event rather than waiting for one day for other agencies to catch up. These new use cases made us rename SDX into ADEX. The technology used by ADEX can support events in general. Some event examples are status updates, traffic conditions, fire alarms, meter readings, footfall, car park in out, and etc. Some agencies have begun to look at continuous data streams like meter readings, crowd counting, and live video analytics. They are especially interested in the replay feature of streams processing, so you can retrieve all data from the stream. So it has come into picture to enable the sharing of these new events and streaming use, use cases. Next. So in an organization or agency, when you start to migrate your monolith systems into microservices, you end up needing an events queue to handle tasks that can be processed in the background or subscribe to certain processes, signals from other systems you end up having to have a message queue for pop-up events. At the up level, you have to integrate multiple systems together. Modern systems will want to integrate for real time. So instead of pushing data from one system to another, many systems can start to subscribe to events. This leads to less coupling within the systems and better agility to support changing business needs. Next. When you think of the uh, government as a large enterprise, every agency then becomes like a business, business department that needs to integrate with the whole of government. Now you have different systems from different departments with different kinds of data that can be shared across the whole of government. The data matched across different agencies will need a way to be discovered and used. The data events created need to be able to cross agency boundaries in real time. Therefore, in the whole government, ADEX comes 
becomes the central nervous system to get to gel this mesh of data together. Next. So what is index? Okay, next. So what is index? Um, it's designed to be a central data exchange for the whole of government to share real-time data to enable agencies to mesh data together. It is a self-service portal to allow data provider to manage the topics and their data subscribers. ADEX is able to cross uh, network zones with government to allow agencies to subscribe to a wider range of available data sets. Next. Of course, uh, ADEX is built for the government agencies so they can publish and subscribe amongst themselves. But it can also work with uh, the industry or the partners to the to those agencies. And we hope to allow the citizens to use it in the future so they'll be able to innovate with us together. Next. Here's a QR link to the ADEX portal. This is the homepage. Um, you will find some useful links uh, in there. Uh, it's currently only open for government agencies to sign up. So you we only allow email addresses with gov.sg. Next. So once you log in, uh, you see this catalog of topics. It shows tiles of topics uh, with their data classification and the source of data from which agency. You can set the data to be visible to the whole of government at the agency level or team level. This allows you this allows you to control who is able to subscribe to your data, whether it's everyone, government level or agency level, or only to selected people within a team, even across uh, different agencies. There's a search and filter option to help you find the data you need, and you can click into the tile to see more detail on this on the topic. Next. So in, within the portal itself, uh, there's a uh, this, uh, this page where the publisher can see who has subscribed to their topics. He can also look at requests to subscribe and approve or reject them. So this is, gives him further control on who can receive the data. Next. The main protocol supported is uh, MQTT, which was designed for sensors. However, MQTT also works for non-sensor data. Uh, here we have uh, popular technologies for event-driven architecture. SDX started with uh, Solus. Then we added uh, Rabbit for the cloud implementation. The new, new streaming technologies like Kafka and Nuts Jet Stream are in. Kafka is getting into the picture as more agencies start to experiment on streaming and the replay capability. The good thing about Kafka is that it has many connectors to integrate with different protocols and services. services. Okay, next. The text tag used by ADEX, but we are running on GCC, uh, particularly to uh, AWS. Um, our call is RabbitMQ uh, with Golang as our backend and Angular as our front end. Next. Uh, some, of, some of our potential customers uh, who has approached us to use ADEX, some are already on board. Some have even use cases to link that up with their partners from the private sector. Next. So we see that as business evolves, the technology is also evolved. We have uh, seen from history that the industry has moved from client server apps to web apps, to web services, and then REST services, then to mobile apps and microservices, leading into a service mesh of sorts. On the back end, we have seen the, the evolution from SOA to enterprise bus to message queues, then API gateways came in, then there was Hadoop, Spark to process all these data collected. Then we see uh, streams processing. All this leads to data in between the stacks and more data from the output from the application you use. From various agencies, this is there is value when you start to mesh all this together. Next. 
So you see all this big data going towards machine learning and more and more autonomous things like self-driving cars. But the trend is really going to focus more on customer experience or CX in short. So we want to engage the, the users to anticipate their needs, respond in real time with uh, when an event happens so that we can add value to the customer and even reward them to the government the customer is actually the citizen therefore the citizen are the ones who will benefit when we start to match all the different data from the different domains together next pulling it all together uh, adex is the central platform for real-time data sharing it enables the pops up and streaming use cases to be discovered by the agencies it links the agencies together all this support innovation and enable faster delivery of more exciting apps to the citizen. Yeah, uh, on, the, on the page here, the QR link to more information to ADEX. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ken Chai, for sharing about uh, ADEX as well. Uh, I, I think that was a really insightful um, session uh, on, on ADEX. So uh, I think that we still have a little bit of time before uh, Kai Jin's presentation. Uh, maybe I would ask a question that has been on my mind since. So I know you mentioned um, you would need a government uh, email address to register. So uh, when, when would ADEX be available to the private sector? Mm, we are still uh, looking at the demand. So there are some cases where uh, they have asked for it. So uh, based on that, then we will see, we are planning out and enable that. Okay, uh, my one burning question down. So uh, I will not hold up Kaijin any longer. So uh, let's have Kaijin now, our guest speaker from Confluent, to share more about how citizen services can be enhanced with uh, event-driven architecture. Kaijin, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. So good morning, everyone. And thanks for taking the time to join us today. Also, a big shout out to GovTech for uh, having us and allowing us to share with everyone today. So continuing on the theme of really you know, improving delivery and focusing on the customer, which in this case, you, know, you don't expect the government to operate as a business. But as Ken Chai just mentioned, we really want to focus on how citizens interact with and consume government services. I'll get to that in due time, but before I start, I'll actually just like to draw a bit of background around what you may have you know, noticed from the previous part of uh, what Ken Chua was speaking about, and really the whole concept of transformation. So most of the attendees, most of the audience, you're probably aware of the transformation to some extent, but at the core, what it really means to us at Confluent is that we focus on the data that is really used to drive all of these interactions and all of this transformation. And what we see is that we are going from a situation where technology was seen as you know, a cost center and expense, a support function, good to have. And you have uh, extending on that team, uh, many of the audience might have heard the phrase of good enough before, especially when you go out there and you ask for you know, enhancements, budgets, time resources but with digital transformation what's happening is that technology becomes the core of the business and this is regardless of which area or which aspect of operations that you may be involved in uh, you know can i dropped a few examples of uh, agencies that are very data rich in our government uh, folks like hdb lta essentially anyone who works with anything is going to have to look at at data as being the core of what they do. And if we think about what we know about transformation in general, there's a few themes that come across. When we think about compute, for example, we have the whole move to cloud. So we are rethinking what a data center means to us. When we think about decision making, then you have things like ML, AI, which tells us about how we really transform the way we make decisions. Uh, in the private sector, for example, you have the whole concerns over, say, fraud, um, you know, improper access to somebody else's uh, assets. 
And even in the public sector, you have the concern over somebody who may be using uh, the identity of especially a vulnerable citizen to get access to services and benefits. And then you have the user experience. I don't know how many of you would have your phone next to you right now, but it's the whole concept of everyone having their app. And then we start moving beyond that to everything being on one app, especially for the government, when you look at things like One Service, Life SG, you know, having an app alone is not enough because everyone's getting overloaded with the number of apps you have on your phone. But that's really the experience we have and the kind of channels that we interact with our services. But lastly, it's about the blood that flows through all of these systems, the data. So anything in the world is actually an event. And again, Ken Chai had some examples, you know, IoT, logs, interactions with people. And what Confluent does is that we want to encourage everyone out there to really think about the way that you interact with your data. Because if we use a really natural comparison, would you try to cross a street with a photograph of the street from five minutes ago? Now, most of the audience will probably say no, unless you're using an overhead bridge, in which case, you know, clearly that's not what we're talking about here. But when a organization works with data, this is all too commonly what we see happening. And the reason for this is that for the longest time, the data that we've had access to and worked with is what we call at rest. It is stored somewhere. You know, and most of the time that's on a database. So if you know how a database works, you ask questions of it using something like SQL. So these happen at a specific point in time. You know, not to go too technical, but select from where something. You fire that off, you get your answer. The problem with that is that you ask too often and your database says, I can't do it. You know, I'm overloaded and I can't keep up. And if you think about the number of systems and services that we are trying to build, as this sprawl increases, it only gets worse because you have folks trying to access somebody else's database across environments, across agencies, potentially across a on-premise location and into the cloud. And all of these forms really fragile and difficult to maintain point-to-point -point integrations that end up tightly coupling everyone together. So things like ADEX, for example, and to some extent Apex even, were really created to try and introduce a whole concept of loose coupling because without that, it becomes very hard to innovate. It becomes very hard to introduce new services and to make them available because you're really trying to untangle what's essentially a plate of uh, you know, spaghetti. And that's really, really difficult if you've ever tried it. Uh, don't play with your food, by the way. So what Confluent is really promoting and what we think would make sense is really looking at the concept of data as it is in motion, as events are occurring, and to us as users of these, uh, we are all individually citizens as well. This is really the whole concept of in real time. You know, I want something, I want it now. If you come back to me two hours later, I might have forgotten, it might not be relevant. And Ken Chai actually touched about, on the subject of this as well when he mentioned streams processing, which is really not just looking at individual isolated events because no man is an island and no event exists by itself but really the ability to put these together and figure out what's going on, what somebody is trying to do, are they exhibiting unusual behavior? Is there something that we need to be aware of that we want to proactively respond to? If you join us early enough and you're watching GovTech's video right at the start, you think about even something like InfoSec, you know, when they mention putting isolated pieces of information together to understand what's going on. That's exactly what we want to do, but we want to do it faster. We want to do it while to use layman terms, the event is hot and it is relevant when action is likely to be the most impactful. And the benefit of doing this is that by looking at data in motion, what it allows us to do is that it allows us to go from that big plate of spaghetti, which is really should be a logical view to something that is more like a central nervous system, much like the human body, where every service and application simply knows one place to go to to get its data, the whole concept of the exchange that's been mentioned a few times so far. Now, if you just take one piece of um, conclusion away from today's meetup, 
what we hope to really drive home is the fact that having data in motion forms a critical central nervous system for any organization today to continue functioning and providing positive and meaningful experiences to its customers or in the case of the government, its citizens. And Kafka itself is a really powerful event streaming technology that helps to empower organizations to adopt the whole practice of data in motion. And this is really important because for many of the folks in the audience, you would likely have experience in one of the other areas of transformation. And you'll also likely know as a result of that, that there's a really deep and very mature literature and practice around all of these areas of the um, IT environment. So things like the data center, we know all about things like virtualization, all the way from compute, storage, network, all of these. You know, the whole development of applications, for example, software as a practice, we know about DevOps, we know about microservices, there's literally tens, if not hundreds of books on the subject. But when we think about data, surprisingly, it's not the case. Uh, now, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but just as a comparison, it's a lot harder to find information on how to manage your data as it flows, how to get insights out of it. And that's really part of the whole concept of the whole data mesh that we are talking about. And if you look for parallels, it's conceptually somewhat similar to the idea of, say, a service mesh for microservices. But here, we are not as interested in creating the applications themselves, but rather to feed them the data that they need to operate. At its core, a mesh is much like what you see on the screen, a connection between multiple independent domains, which in the government would potentially be different agencies, different ministries, different groups that have ownership over data. Now, your first question would be, how is this different from the spaghetti that we were talking about earlier? And the, the key difference is actually something that I've mentioned, which is this is a logical view. If we look at what happens behind the scene though, uh, I wouldn't spend too much time talking about the physical implementation. We don't have time for that today. But there's four key principles that really we should be keeping in mind when we think about how we are going to build this mesh and exchange data with one another. And they go in somewhat sequential order. I'll explain that in a minute, but I'll talk through the principles first. Uh, the first of this is actually the concept of domain-driven decentralization, borrowing from the idea of domain-driven design, which is that we have to recognize data comes from somewhere, and it is the responsibility of a data producer to have control over to, and to be able to define what they're putting on the mesh. Uh, many of you will have heard the term garbage in, garbage out. So the fastest way to avoid that is to not put garbage in the mesh in the first place. Which leads us to the second principle. Data is a first class product. You know, it's no longer just a byproduct of saying, hey, you know, as a result of having IoT sensors, I can give you logs, I can give you images, I can give you an idea of what's going on. But it's the idea that there should be a reason why this data exists on the mesh. So there may be raw data that exists in our own domain, we are working with it, we are refining it. But when we put it out there for someone else, much like any commercial product, if it's not useful, if it's not good, if it's not reliable, if it's not repeatable, nobody's going to want it. You know, which comes to a somewhat philosophical question. If I create a product and nobody wants it, is it still a product? Now, the whole idea of why you want these products is exactly because of something Kencha actually showed earlier that some of you might have noticed the significance of. Once you have products, you can build a catalog. In this case, the catalog of ADEX, for example, is that whole offering of what data is available. You may have noticed metadata, who this data came from, who can access this data, and classifications especially as we move towards a stage where we want to share information across potentially between the government and the private sector, the ability to categorize and attach metadata to your data becomes even more important, which naturally leads us to the last principle. You do need governance. Data is a very powerful thing and recent events have shown that. I won't go too much into that. 
But the whole idea here is that you need the ability to have interoperability while still being able to secure and to be able to find out who has access data when and for what reason. Now, this process doesn't happen overnight. And the folks at GovTech who have actually worked on it would be more than happy to share with you their struggles and all the effort they put in. But as we approach this from a high level, what we need to remember is that there is a sequence to this and much like any other parts of technology, there are prerequisites. So while we don't expect things to happen overnight, with awareness of these principles and how to build up step by step, it will help us to succeed a lot more quickly and in a lot more risk managed, a lot more secure fashion. Right, so to round off with a quick example, uh, you know, Singapore has live.sg and uh, without offense, this is not a fresh concept. Other governments try to do it because everyone wants to provide good services for the citizen. Uh, the example we have comes from Norway, halfway across the world, but they've done something very similar. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Life is a sequence of events. And now just imagine, on top of finding all your information in one place, everything you need to do, what if based on events that happen, you could get proactive access? Imagine not having to you know, apply for a service. Uh, you just had a kid in a public hospital. Congratulations, here's your baby benefit, by the way. And here are some suggestions of things that you may want to do. And that's really the key part of having something in real time that decreases red tape and increases the propensity of a citizen to interact with the government, especially today when there's a whole lot of concern around privacy and tracking, coupled with the fact that there's still a bit of preconceived notion in many parts of the population that the government is difficult to interact with. It's slow, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of paperwork. Improving these services is a key part of making sure that the services we build end up being consumed and end up delivering value for what we've put into them. Now, just as a quick wrap up of my portion, uh, so as you have seen, you know, we're all here today because we are part of a community. And if you are interested to learn more about what Kafka does, we do have a Kafka community as well that you can feel free to uh, really access and you'll know, join us. There's a lot of interesting information going on there. With that said, I'll just wrap up my portion of the presentation and hand it back to the folks at GovTech. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ken Chai. Uh, no, sorry, Kai Chin. Both start with a K, sorry. Thank you so much for the sharing. And uh, thanks also for um, sharing about the communities. Uh, we, we really hope that the SEX community as well as the Confluent community uh, will be able to work more closely to pre provide such uh, great content for our techies as well. So um, now we will take questions from the floor. Uh, I see that we do have um, some questions that are in the Q&A panel currently. Uh, to everyone here, do feel free to uh, continue plumping in your questions in uh, the Q&A panel. Uh, our speakers will be able to take them um, based on the topics. Uh, I also have a couple of questions for both of our speakers, but um, perhaps let's move into uh, the questions from our attendees today. Uh, maybe the first question, uh, Kim Chai, you could quickly run through. Uh, Tian Huat has a question about um, backend on ADEX. What sort of technology is actually being used? Yeah, so uh, ADEX is using uh, RabbitMQ as the core. Uh, we, are, we are looking at Kafka or uh, so using that Solus again, uh, but uh, that's in the plan, in the pipeline. Uh, you also see there's another question from Tian Huat yeah, about um, whether it supports uh, streaming. So uh, Rabbit is uh, right now a uh, pops up uh, technology. It just recently added some streaming uh, capabilities. So uh, ADEX doesn't support uh, streaming yet, but uh, we will be uh, enhancing it to, to do this uh, very soon. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank, thank you, thank you, Ken Chai. And uh, yeah, likewise, hope we answered uh, Tian Hot's question. Um, maybe I have, there's another question that I had in mind also. So um, for Kai Jin, uh, what would you say actually is the difference between um, you know, the other source of technology like REST API, MQ, and uh, as, as opposed to Kafka? Yep, so uh, that's a great question. And I think the key difference, and it's actually come up in the Q&A, part of it is the ability to replay. And can I touch on that as well? The whole concept of stream processing, because your first conclusion may not always be perfect. 
especially in terms of when you think about ML, for example, you need to retrain, you need to iterate, you may even need to fit in corrections from differences between real and predicted behavior. Um, the second key difference is that with things like API especially, there's a very strong existing concept of request and response. Whereas in an eventing system, we do need to be aware that a lot of the time, the event producer may be firing off data without the expectation that anyone's going to acknowledge or accept it. So that's why uh, the whole fact of an API may not, or rather a RESTful API may not always be the best fit for every kind of event. Okay, thank you. Uh, hope, hope that uh, that gave more insights to everyone as well, because that was something I had in mind. Um, maybe I will follow up with a sales question to Kai Jin as well. So uh, Sal is actually asking um, Kai Jin to explain a bit more on the reuse, uh, on whether the reuse and scalable as an attribute from the Norway Gov example. Uh, yes, so, so basically in terms of attributes um, from the example that you shared. So I won't spend too much on this because they actually presented at Kafka Summit a couple of years back and uh, you can actually find that video. But very quickly, two core tenets of what they did. Firstly, the ability to capture data just once and consume it as many times as possible. So you can imagine, or rather as many times as required rather. So you can imagine as an agency, I need some data on car parks, for example, from HDB and URA to understand traffic flows or some other things. Instead of having to go back to them every single time I rehash my application or build something new, I get it off this exchange and it doesn't cause any scalability issues for them. It means that you know, they don't need to be aware of how many consumers they have. Now, a very key part of that, of course, is in terms of reusability, also making sure that this data is curated in terms of who can access it based on attributes. Uh, so folks who are in the public sector may be aware, for example, extremely sensitive data, such as tax information, income information, births and deaths. You'll want to have some of this, uh, as Genchai had shown, the cataloging capability and the ability to have approval flows, auditability and standards as to who can access this. Thanks, Ken Chai. I uh, hope that answered your question, Sal. Uh, thanks also for repeating your question uh, in the Q&A panel so that uh, everyone can see it. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, maybe I'll direct the next question from Sud here to Ken Chai. So Sud here is asking, um, is ADEX about bringing the data to a single exchange platform or taking analytics to, da to the data? Yeah. So uh, is ADEX going to be a single exchange platform? Uh, yes, we try to be the single exchange platform so that uh, all the data can be consolidated together and be discovered from one place. The analytics part, uh, ADEX is uh, still announcing to do some simple analytics, but there are other, other analytics uh, engines out there which can be clients of ADEX. They will subscribe and then they will do their own analytics. I think that that is yep. quite relevant to uh, Lynn's question as well. So uh, the question is, is there a single platform available to support the uh, data mesh and all its principles? So maybe I can invite uh, both Kian Chai and uh, Kai Jin to hop on on this question. Yeah, single platform available to support data mesh. Uh, Kai Jin. <laughs> so now, as a technology vendor, I would love to tell you, yes, and it's my technology. But realistically, today, there's no one technology that does everything. Because you have aspects of the physical piping, the capture ones, consume many, some aspects of stream processing that Kafka does. Then you have aspects around, for example, cataloging, around proxying, uh, potentially even around exposing between agencies, between different groups of users, where you may think about things like API gateways. Um, so you'll likely have to put a combination of a few technologies together. The good news is that for each of these aspects, there are mature technologies and more and more driven by demand from both the end users, the customers and citizens, but also the organizations themselves. Interoperability is increasing. There are more and more native integrations. So you'll be unlikely to have to buy a whole basket of you know, 10, 20 different technologies to get this to work. 
Uh, yeah, so I, I guess um, that, that answers the question in a nutshell. Um, okay, I'm looking at um, all the questions that are available in the Q&A panel. Thanks everyone for, for coming in. Uh, maybe I'll direct the next question uh, to Kian Chai as well. So uh, Stephen has a question. So besides Kafka, will ADEX consider adding um, other streaming technologies like Apache Pulsar? Uh, as he has said that Pulsar has technical merits, uh, such as being less prone to uh, message loss. Um, okay. Um, we are always looking out for technologies that support the use cases that we are looking at. So uh, Pulsar is something we haven't looked at honestly. So uh, whether it's, it's suitable or not, how's, how's the cost? Uh, that's, uh, we have to have some time to, to evaluate it. Okay, hope, hope that answers your question, mm. Stephen. Uh, okay, let's see other questions. Uh, for our speakers, if you do see any questions that um, you're keen to answer, uh, you can just hop on or um, just join in uh, when one, one of us uh, is speaking. Uh, okay, maybe um, there's another question from Ka Xiong. Uh, I assume it is uh, related to ADEX, but uh, Kai Jin, very, very welcome to um, jump in as well. So Kai Xiong is asking, uh, what kind of data should be exchanged? Um, just metadata or should um, unstructured data such as uh, images, audio be included? Then um, if it's just metadata, uh, he is um, commenting that technologies uh, that are being used right now might have some uh, limitations. So maybe I get both speakers to weigh in. So maybe I'll take a quick shot at it first. Uh, for those of the audience who are familiar with Kafka, you may know, for example, that extremely large messages are usually not exchanged using Kafka. There are technical reasons for this, but there are also patterns to resolve it. So for example, the code check pattern where you exchange the location and some metadata about what you're passing. So you know, giving a very broad, uh, very broad reply to a question would be, as a data producer, you would have to decide what you share and some of the aspects of, for example, reliability, compatibility, being able to define a clear and consistent standard for what you're producing would really uh, drive your decision on what you exchange through the mesh. Uh, so, and of course, as data consumers, as we talk about self-servicing, there might be things like a request uh, process where, you know, much like a commercial entity, uh, if there's sufficient demand for a certain feature, or in this case, a certain data product, then the data producer will be a lot more uh, really motivated to provide it in, in a productized fashion. Yeah, uh, I'd, like to add, I'd like to add on that. So uh, yes, uh, preferability better data. There's also raw data that, is, uh, link can, that can be exchanged. Uh, videos and such like uh, long streaming data, these are usually not so suitable in a, in a shared consolidated exchange like index. Uh, maybe it can be used as a as an individual exchange within the within one organization, but as a shared platform, uh, usually we don't like to have a uh, big streams of data coming in, as in a uh, huge chunks of data. This because this will uh, this will compete the, with the resources within the system. Thanks, thanks yep. both, and uh, thanks Kashyong for asking this question as well. Uh, maybe also there are another two questions that uh, I could direct to both of our speakers uh, from Manoj as well as from Tina. So Manoj is asking, uh, is it common to use data leak within uh, the central nervous system? And then um, Tina also has a question on uh, who or how will the data be validated? So, all right, maybe I'll take a shot at uh, Manoj's question first, uh, since it came in, in first. <laughs> so, uh, as with many folks in IT, the correct answer is it depends. But I think end of the day, especially from Confluence's point of view, is that a data lake is a repository. So, it tends to be something that is fed by the nervous system, but should not be, a lot of the time, something that other consumers are trying to attach into in a mesh form. Uh, especially because it serves a very specific purpose. So what tends to happen a lot is that individual consumers would, if they have a need for some of the functions, for example, 
big data analytics that a data lake provides, they would extract this data and place it within their own data lake, at which point it's their own domain. So you have the whole concept of how you want to mangle or manipulate or really um, you know, extract and query the data, you can do so from your own lake instead of potentially exposing all that to other consumers as well. Yeah, can try. Uh, I see that you also want to uh, have some comments on this. Yeah, um, data lake, I feel it's not a must, but some companies already have their data lake. So I guess uh, that becomes their source of uh, truth. But actually, based on data mesh, you actually want the data to be owned by the provider. So the data lake may not be a very a uh, suitable way in a, in a data mesh uh, environment. Okay, I'll also take on the uh, question to who will validate the data by Tina Tan. So um, this one, for ADEX, we, we will look at the, the data that's being published to us uh, from the agency and then look out for any uh, format errors and that's about it. So uh, the, it is really up to the publisher, the provider to make sure that their data is correct. So, uh, so the other, other the consumers who consume them will, will don't get any kind of garbage data. So that is the, the principle behind sharing this kind of uh, data. Definitely. I think Hygiene also touched about it, uh, the garbage in, garbage out uh, kind of principle, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Kaijin, would you like to also uh, weigh in on this or we yeah. or we can move on? We do have uh, some other questions from <laughs> all of our really great audience today. Okay, so I'll, I'll just spend a few seconds on this, which is as Joyce, you just mentioned. Uh, I think a big part of that is that as producers and you know, going back to very fundamentals, as individual actors, we do need to be responsible. So at the very least, the first step of validation should lie with us. You know, technology can do so much, but at the end of the day, humans can always break it. You imagine, I always validate this data, for example, a credit card number. It's a 16-digit number. So I put in 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's a valid format, but we know that's not going to work. So that's why, as a producer, you know best what's supposed to be in this field. The definition of the field itself and you know, automation technology can only go so far. And by the time it reaches the exchange, folks like Kian Chai and the rest of GovTech you know, they aren't in your business, so they will try, but there's only so much they can do as well. Thanks, thanks for that, Kaijin. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, maybe we move on. I, I do see a couple of questions here that are also kind of in line with um, a question that I would like to ask as well. Uh, it, my, my question initially was about um, the roadmap of ADEX, so what's there ahead? Uh, I see that um, Vincent as well as Isaac uh, and possibly even Jackson, uh, questions are you know kind of in line with that. So perhaps I can invite Ken Chai to talk about um, kind of what's up ahead and what uh, can our techies uh, look forward to. So uh, yeah, for index uh, within uh, for our roadmap, uh, there is uh, within GovTech there is other tech stacks that are being developed, and we are looking at. Uh, integrating with those tech stacks. Uh, so that was, that's the priority now. But uh, in terms of the technology wise, uh, we always need to evaluate first and then uh, see what's, uh, what's uh, popular, what's good out there, what's easier to implement in terms of cost. Uh, then we can uh, try to implement that. So uh, there's a estimated timeline for commercial entities. Uh, we see that coming uh, pretty soon. So probably within this year, we may allow some selected uh, uh, commercial entities to come in. Uh, with that, uh, after, if it goes well, then we may uh, freely open it um, probably in the next year. Yeah, that, that is really good news. I, I think that uh, quite a lot of our community uh, present online now uh, would be very happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Isaac also has a question. So um, he's looking to develop data mesh for his organization. So uh, will it be possible to publish um, ADEX in the mesh? Yeah. So I would think that you'll be subscribing to data from, for your mesh. So uh, ADEX becomes a, a, a data provider to the 
data mesh. So it's part of another data mesh. So <laughs> I see that as a possibility. Uh, uh, we can we can explore those as well. Yep. So uh, if if anyone has questions, uh, can look for Ken Chai and his uh, he previously shared his link uh for contact uh just now as well. So uh, maybe on one last question about ADEX. Uh, Manoj has another question. So uh, he's asking Kian Chai, could you share some of the challenges or the lessons learned um, during the course of implementing ADEX? Uh, okay. So uh, a lot of the challenges lie in the security. So security is uh, not just a, a physical thing, a physical uh, implementation because there's also policies surrounding it. So the, those are the challenges that uh, we need to talk to the stakeholders and then uh, as we implement, we discover more, because this is a new product. So as we implement, we discover new, new things that we have to look at. So that is like also become an ever-changing uh, uh, ever thing that we have to take care of. Um, Besides that, uh, yeah, there's also many, many different technologies that we can use. So <laughs> it takes time to evaluate all of them. Uh, so there's also, it's a very fast moving uh, industry. Uh, so that is quite, that is also one of the challenge. Hmm. Thanks, thanks, Kian Chai. But uh, I'm sure that all the challenges have resulted in this very fruitful product, which is ADEX. So uh, yes, kudos to the ADEX team. Um, maybe along the lines of um, you know, all the challenges and the lessons learned, uh, I would like to ask Kai Jin um, a question uh, on that. So what recommendations would you actually have for um, maybe a team looking to start to improve uh, their data sharing practices? So the first thing, of course, is to be pragmatic. I think our government prides themselves on being very pragmatic and trying not to, for example, boil the ocean on day one. But more importantly than that also is that on conference site, we talk a lot about the data and you know, just now we mentioned how it's produced. The other part of that is really as an owner or as someone who is trying to start this, understanding where your data comes from. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, right after your web app, for example, it needs to go into the exchange. So within your own environment, you have the freedom to transform and create and basically prepare the end result that then goes up onto the, uh, the mesh or the exchange or whatever form of sharing that you have in mind. Okay, I hope that um, also answered the question. I'm sure a lot of people are here today are curious about um, how, how they should even start uh, to improve their data sharing or you know, um, how they can improve on that. Um, maybe we will take a last question now. Uh, I think Jackson has one last question. Uh, he says that if he has requirements to exchange IoT and video data with analytics, uh, will ADEX be able to support uh, both of these requirements? Okay. Um, IoT data, of course, uh, no problem because uh, ADEX started with uh, sensor data. So uh, for video data, uh, we won't go for the live video streams, uh, the images that will be too much for the system as a, as a shared platform. So we will encourage like a uh, video analytics data, that means post-process data, when you can process uh, the data at, at the edge, and then that process data gets posted to ADEX, uh, that would be a better uh, way to work. Uh, Jackson, hope that answered your question. I see one like, so hopefully it's you. So, uh, okay, I think we have um, some other questions, but that might need um, a bit more time than what we have. So uh, for now, uh, we will be closing this session up. Uh, thank you again for both of our speakers as well as all of your questions. Uh, we have now come to the end of the StackX Meetup. So uh, thank you again um, to Kian Chai, Kai Jin, um, Anna from the Confluent team, uh, as well as everyone here today uh, who took time to learn about the various data sharing solutions that um, our speakers talked about. So uh, before you leave, we would like to get your feedback via the QR code on the left and uh, to invite you to join us in the StackX community as well. Uh, I'll also be sharing all these useful links in the chat. 
Um, so do stay tuned to our Telegram chat and meetup platform for upcoming announcements uh, on all of our initiatives. Uh, also not to forget um, the VOD announcement when it's published on Death Portal. So have a great lunch ahead and a wonderful, wonderful break next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.